LinkedIn has really transformed how salespeople do business. They're just clicking that connect button. They're not sending the you know, personalized message. They're not getting accepted most of the time. For the average salesperson, they're not content creators. And in some cases, they shouldn't be either. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Salesman Podcast. Welcome to today's episode. And today we're diving into a platform which I had, and this is so crazily silly, I had not put much effort in to growing an audience there, to putting out content on it until recently. And that is LinkedIn. And this sounds stupid and silly because clearly a show for B2B millennial sales professionals, LinkedIn would be the obvious choice as a platform to build an audience on. But I always went with Facebook from past experience and it's worked well and it's grown us this far to 10, 20,000 downloads an episode. I've seen the light and I've seen the impact that LinkedIn can have to the number of downloads I get on the show, to the ability to contact influencers within the industry super easily and effective. And from having people contact me from being on my profile and being more visible on there, I think it's super important. I think it's only going to get more important as perhaps social selling, that hype dies down a little bit and just selling on the internet becomes more mainstream. And so, yeah, I've brought on today Melanie Dodaro to dive into this a little bit deeper than what we have done in the past. She is Canada's number one LinkedIn expert. And you can find out more about Melanie over at topdogsocialmedia.com. Uh, all the social links, all her work and a couple of blog posts and her book are linked in the show notes over at salesman.red. And with that, let's jump into today's episode. Hey, Melanie, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Thank you so much. Thrilled to be here today. Good stuff. I'm excited to have you on. And today we're going to talk about social, about LinkedIn and some perhaps some hints and tricks and hacks on LinkedIn in particular. But where I want to start with this, clearly sales is changing, business is changing. And where I want to start is, do you feel that a sales professional with a phone with a LinkedIn app, uh, a phone with a LinkedIn app, a phone that makes phone calls and also an email app and a pen and paper does that like constitute what all that a salesperson needs in 2016 to close deals? Is that do we not need laptops, computers? Do we not even need things like video calling? Is a phone, a smartphone, enough in 2016 to close deals? You know, that's a great question. I was actually thinking about that before we we jumped on. I was thinking, you know, LinkedIn has really transformed how salespeople do business. And I was thinking about it. I was like, well, what what before LinkedIn was, you know, so transformational? And it literally was the phone and email. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it it is absolutely. Now, in terms of, you know, getting rid of a computer per se, I'm actually a big advocate of using LinkedIn on your computer versus on a mobile device. Having said that, there's many things that you can do on a mobile device. Uh, of course, you can be responding to messages and, and so forth, but it's a little bit trickier to do some of the things that, uh, that I teach people to do when they're using LinkedIn for prospecting, which is always personalizing your connection requests. There is ways to do it, but it's a little bit more complex and it's just a lot easier to do from a desktop computer or a laptop computer. So, uh, you know, if, you, if you're, LinkedIn is part of your daily prospecting, let's say you spend, you know, 15 or 30 or 60 minutes a day on it, I would be spending those, that period of time in front of the computer using it. And then if you're checking in on it, uh, you know, over the course of the day, absolutely check in via your mobile device. And why is that? And we can dive into some of the specifics uh, potentially, because uh, I've noticed that on when I add someone on the desktop, most cases it, asks, it gives me the opportunity to write a, you know, introduction kind of thing. But then when I add people on mobile, it doesn't give me that option. Is that because they're fading it in or out, or is it just a bug or an oversight? Why is that? Yeah, it just doesn't have the same level of functionality as the as the, the desktop version. So you know, with limited functionality, uh, it's easy to make mistakes. Um, so you know, people can easily you know just hit that connect button, thinking that they're going to get the opportunity to. Uh, customize that message. You know, one of the things that happens to me every single time I speak uh, at an event, I'll always say to the audience, I said, you know, I don't accept in LinkedIn connections anymore unless somebody's personalizing it or unless I know them because I'm very close to the cap of, you know, how many connections mm. I can have. So I was saying, how many is that? Is, because that's something I only learned recently that I started asking the audience to add me on there that 
I've started getting throttled and warnings and stuff because of the, the amount of people adding me in, in a short period of time. Yeah, so it's 30,000 uh, you know, connections that you can have, basically. You can request after you reach that limit to have LinkedIn add more, but you're at their liberty whether they're going to say yes or no. So, you know, most people never will reach that that limit. Uh, but because of that, you want to be able to make sure that, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, the people that I'm connecting with are real, uh, that they know, you know, that they know who I am. And, you know, there's a lot of, on all social networks, there's a lot of spam. There's a lot of, you know, fake accounts and stuff like that. So when somebody sends me a personalized note, I know they're real. And especially if they say, hey, Melanie, you know, I just saw you speak at X event or heard you on, uh, you know, this podcast or this webinar. Um, I know that they're real and I always accept them. Even if their profile doesn't include a picture, which is usually another criteria, I won't accept people without a picture, but I will because I know it's a real person behind that. And so what will happen often is, you know, if I'm on stage and I'm saying, you know, feel free to send me a message uh, a connection request, but personalize it, please, letting letting me know that you heard me speak here. Uh, then they'll hit the connect button on their mobile, and it'll send the generic message, and then they'll send me another message afterwards saying, oh my gosh, Melanie, I'm so sorry. It didn't give me the opportunity to. So now when I'm speaking, I'm like, don't use your mobile device right now. <laughs> Hold off. And, uh, you know, and then I'll explain to them basically how to do it. But yeah, you know, there's just a lot more functionality with the desktop version. You and I might be uh, without, uh, I'm trying to not sound like we're special here, but you and I might be separate cases in this, in that um, you clearly have way more uh, connections and followers than that on there than me, because I've only been, I've only been experimental with it the past two weeks. Um, but I'm sure I'll get to that point in the next few months. For the average decision maker for the people in the C-suite, do they have the same thoughts on this? Will they only accept a connection, a connection request from someone who's personalized it? Or would they be perhaps a bit more liberal if a salesperson is trying to connect with them? Um, and, and we'll come on to the perhaps the process and the protocol of doing it after that. Yeah, well, you have to remember the higher up the food chain you go in terms of, you know, C-suite and so forth, uh, the more they get inundated with stuff. And so you have to be, uh, you know, above, you know, how everybody else is approaching them. And so most people just don't even know. They're just clicking that connect button. They're not sending the, uh, you know, personalized message. They're not getting accepted most of the time. So, um, and for a salesperson, you know, one of the things that's wonderful about LinkedIn is you have ungated access to decision makers that you don't have necessarily on Facebook or Twitter because a C-suite uh, executive is not managing the company's Twitter or Facebook, <laughs> but they are managing their own personal LinkedIn, right? So you do have that ability, but you have to be able to cut through the noise because they are getting inundated. And so, you know, it starts really with making sure that you have a great profile and not too salesy of a profile. You know, one of the things that I teach salespeople is, you know, don't be going on and on about all your sales awards because your ideal clients don't care about that. Unless you're looking for a job, that's, you know, when you're definitely going to want to put those things into your profile. But if you're not looking for a job, if you're looking to use LinkedIn as a business building tool for your, uh, you know, existing position as a sales professional, then make sure that your profile really speaks to that target audience that you're looking to, that it speaks to who they are, the problems they have, and the solutions that you offer, and is very client-focused. Less about you, more about them. So, you know, what somebody's going to do, if you've got a nice personalized note, then they might likely click on your profile just to say, who is this person? And that next step has to be in place for them to actually accept. So if you've got those in place, you know, a nice personalized note, not trying to pitch them or sell them anything, <laughs> not saying, hey, you know, I think you'd love our product or service. I'd love to connect with you here on LinkedIn. That's the surest way to get reported as spam or yeah. simply ignored. Um, but, you know, really reaching out and finding, you know, some reason to be able to reach out to them in a, uh, in a non threatening in a in a non-salesy non-pitchy kind of manner and is this something that you see often in a salesperson's profile being half for the prospect and half that are aware that prospects and customers might see it and the other half is well for recruiters and the, the people that might be offering and headhunts and them jobs as well well you really need to decide when you're using linkedin what your goal and objective is because you can't do both you can't do both successfully. And, and on that, 
Melanie, does LinkedIn know what it wants users to be doing on that? Because I know when I first joined, it was just a CV or resume. That, that's Seemingly that's all it was. And then I got, I've had a couple of guests on the show who ripped me to shreds, pulled the profile to bits. Uh, clearly, I had to up my game on it. So I've redone it and it, now it's a lot more focused and I can clearly see the difference between the two. But you know, this it seems it seems that LinkedIn is going on this evolution away, perhaps from it being a resume and more into being a profile of your of your current, you know, who you're trying to attract. Would that be? Yeah. Would I be justified in saying that? Yeah. So LinkedIn's gone through quite an evolution, as you mentioned, and it's really transformed from the early days, which was very much a recruitment, job seeking kind of uh, platform, to a B two B and full out business platform and, and, and a very strong content marketing platform as well. So it really has, uh, you know, changed its identity. However, a lot of people still kind of see it the way that it used to be. And in that uh, are, are, you know, setting it up as a CV, which is not necessarily, you know, the right way to approach it if you're not looking for a job. If you're looking for a job, you're going to absolutely approach it that way. If you're looking for business, you're looking for prospects, clients, leads, and so forth, you're going to take a different approach. And at any time with your LinkedIn profile, you can change it, right? So, you know, if you're using it right now for prospecting for your existing position, then you focus on that. And if at a later date you decide, hey, you know what, I'm not happy in this position or I'm not happy with this company, then you can go back and, and put some of that stuff in there that really highlights your achievements and you know is well positioned for recruiters and, and so forth. Okay, so you mentioned content marketing then. This is an opportunity perhaps to make your profile even more client focused and, and more bespoke to your industry and to put yourself across as a a mini thought leader, perhaps, and show your expertise. But should salespeople, uh, and this is a general question, but do you feel so salespeople should be curating content and putting it on LinkedIn uh, Pulse, or should they be purely curating other people's content and sharing it within the feed? Yeah, so there's there's you know multiple ways to share content on LinkedIn. One is LinkedIn Publisher, and those published posts actually live on your profile. So right below your picture, you know you'll see the last three, and if you click to see more, you can see them all. It's a great opportunity for people to learn more about how you can help them, learn more about you, and so forth. Um, but for the average salesperson, they're not content creators, and in some cases, they shouldn't be either. You know, if, that, if that's not a strength for them, if they're, if yeah. that's a strength for them, then absolutely go for it. But if it's not, you don't want to be putting up lousy content. And it very much is, you know, the company's responsibility to be provi providing that content uh, for their sales for their sales teams. So what they should be doing is definitely curating content, uh, industry content, their company's content as status updates. Uh, you know, you can be sharing it in groups when it's relevant. Um, and, you know, if the company is uh, providing content that can be repurposed as a LinkedIn publisher post, like they're providing articles that their employees can, you know, put into their profiles, then great. That's fantastic. Uh, but yes, you know, sharing content on a, see, here's the thing. Basically what you're doing when, when you're building your LinkedIn, uh, you know, your LinkedIn, um, connections is you want you're 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 building them with targeted prospects so you want to be staying top of mind with those prospects that you've already uh, engaged with that you've already connected with sharing relevant content that's going to be of interest to them is key in order to do that so it keeps you top of mind you might be connecting with a prospect today that doesn't know that they need what you have right now or it isn't a top of mind problem right now mm -hmm. but it might be in two months from now so you staying on their radar over the next two months is really important. And is there any best practices for sales professionals to be sharing and curating content on LinkedIn? I'm sure a marketer would take a different approach and would experiment and uh, you know A/B test and all this kind of thing. And uh, perhaps a salesperson doesn't have the the time or the expertise to go down that route. Should salespeople, if if it's possible, if we can give them a process, should they be posting? Uh, you know, two pieces of content a day, one at lunch, one after work. And is it, again, and this is a question I ask all the time, is it better to be posting more posts to stay top of mind by just a visibility standpoint of your name being on the person's feed? Or is it more important to post high quality content? Well, the answer is both. <clears throat> so, um, you know, you once a day is fine for a status update. 
if you're posting articles to LinkedIn, your own articles or your company's articles to LinkedIn Publisher, uh, you know, once a week or once every two weeks is fine. Uh, but status updates you can do daily, at least Monday through Friday. And one of the tricks that you can do to find that content to be sharing is utilizing Twitter in conjunction with LinkedIn and creating Twitter lists of industry, uh, you know, industry content. So it might be, you know, industry publications, magazines, newspapers, whatever. Could be, uh, you know, other people in a similar industry that are serving the same target audience that might have content that's very relevant. Uh, you know, obviously you want to be careful about sharing competitor content, but there might be times when that makes sense as well. Uh, you know, especially if you want to put your own spin on it, who knows, right? So, you know, with a status update, you're only, you know, it's typically you're only posting a couple of questions and a link. I, I'm sorry, a couple of sentences and a link. Uh, you know, one might be, you, you know, your perspective on why somebody should read that article. That's really important. If you're sharing content, don't just share a link. People want to know your perspective. Why are you sharing this content? It's also dangerous to share content that you haven't read. <laughs> <laughs> So you want to be reading it, you know, just before you're sharing it. Uh, and, you know, it's a great opportunity to keep yourself educated on, you know, your industry as well by, you know, sharing one piece of content per day. Sorry to interrupt that. And you've, you've connected with the person, uh, your prospect. You've stayed top of mind over a period of, say, a few weeks or so. They, you know that they've checked out your profile because you've gone back and forth and you've seen that they've, they've been on there. So they, you've, you broke through this barrier of obscurity there's perhaps a slight, tiny bit of trust there in that you've not spammed them and you've not, uh, you've not tried to abuse the relationship that you've already like, partly built. How do we go about making that first contact then after this point? Should we be using in-mail messaging or should we just scrap all that and go straight to the email? And this is something that I don't really, and you'll be able to explain this, but I don't really see the benefits of a LinkedIn mail other than perhaps... Uh, your LinkedIn inbox is probably less busy than your normal inbox. Yeah, so this is exactly what I talk about in my book, The LinkedIn Code. It's you know how to set up a lead generation uh, uh, campaign basically on LinkedIn. So what that consists of is the initial connection request, so personalized connection request. From there, you want to send a, what I call a welcome message. So you thank them for connecting afterwards. So saying, you know, hey, Will, you know, thanks so much for accepting my connection request. You know, I noticed that you are in XYZ industry or you guys are doing really great work over there, XYZ company, you know, something personalized to them. And then, you know, maybe something of value to them. You know, have you seen this recent article that, you know, XYZ publication posted? Or, you know, my company just put out this article on the 10 things that, you know, XYZ companies need to be focusing on 2016. I thought you might find it interesting. Here's a couple of, uh, of bullet points that will let you know what you're going to learn from this article. Hope you enjoy it. Let me know your thoughts. <clears throat> so you're starting a dialogue and providing value. You're not trying to sell or pitch anything. Then a week later, you can do something very similar to that. You know, you, maybe you come across, uh, again, an industry uh, uh, article a uh, piece of content might be, you know, not, not, not your company's, it might be somebody else's, but you're just kind of saying, hey, did you get a chance to see this? I thought it was really interesting. Here's why I think you might, uh, you know, find it interesting. And then from there, you know, you've, you've taken a couple weeks to start to establish some rapport, build a little value. Uh, then, you know, you can move to the next step and, and really kind of like, you know, ask them, you know, maybe, maybe they're not the, the right person that you need to connect with at the company. Hey, you know, I was thinking that, you know, uh, I'd love to just get on the phone with, you know, you or the person that's in charge of this to discuss, uh, you know, this platform that we have or to, to find out what kind of challenges that you guys are having with this because, you know, we're very much involved in that or whatever, you know, basically what you're doing is positioning a phone call or a meeting, mm -hmm. or a Skype call, however you do business. For me, if I'm local and dealing with somebody, it might be a meeting in person. If I'm dealing with somebody across you know, North America, it, it'll be a phone call. If I'm dealing with somebody in the UK or overseas, uh, it'll be a Skype call. Right? So it really kind of depends. So really just kind of moving. You know, One of my favorite quotes is, you need to slow down the sale to speed it up. Right? The sales, sales professionals go in too fast and too hard. Hey, I think you're going to love our product. Can we set up a call? You know, no value. And is that something that you see <laughs> in time. your training? All the time. Yeah. <laughs> All okay. the time, yeah. They go in too hard, too fast, and uh, haven't established any value, any trust, or any rapport. And is a couple of weeks, which is what I scribbled down here, 
Is that the kind of time frame we're looking at yeah, to even just approach that first phone call? Absolutely. It's, it's the perfect amount of time. It's not too fast and it's not too slow. So, you know, people make two mistakes with social media, LinkedIn uh, specifically. They go in too hard, too fast, or they never ask for the phone call. They never ask for the meeting. They're just sharing content and engaging and doing this <laughs> stuff. And they forget, to, and, and this isn't so much of a problem with sales professionals. It's more of an, a problem with you know, entrepreneurs and people that aren't necessarily trained in sales, that they go too slow. So the, the perfect combination is coming and finding that place in the middle that fits you know, for everybody. So that's generally uh, what I have found works across all industries, across, you know, all different types of uh, decision makers. And would you always stick to the messaging to get the call? Or would you, because this is what I've done most of the time through, and no experimentation here, but I would do the, the lead nurturing, so to speak, on LinkedIn, break through the obscurity, Give them, you know, as much value as you, as you can by sharing content. But then I would probably chase them over an email for the call. And thinking about it, there's no real logical reason to do that. But that's just what I've done by habit, I guess. Would you get try and get the call on LinkedIn? Yeah, I would. You know why? It's because LinkedIn has a little mini built-in CRM where all the conversations are, are, are recorded. Like they're, they're, they live live on the profile so that at any time you can go back and remember where you were. You can set up tags. You can set up reminders. There's all kinds of things that you can do to really stay organized with your prospecting efforts. So if you do move that conversation to email, there's nothing wrong with that. But now you need to go back into LinkedIn. You have to add some really good notes in there to remember, you know, to remember that hey, we moved this conversation, uh, you know, over to email, or we had a phone call, or whatever, so that you can stay organized. Because at any given date, you might go back in there and forget. You know, it could be six months from now or a year from now, and forget. Oh gosh, we were actually having an email exchange, or we actually mm -hmm. did speak on the phone, and you don't even remember it. So it just helps keep everything in uh, a nice, you know, easy to find place. Um, Do we need email then? Because almost everyone is on LinkedIn, aren't they? You don't need email for this purpose necessarily at this stage anyways, maybe after the phone call you do. Uh, because maybe then you're going to be sending them some attachments or, or you know, you're just kind of sure. moving that forward, right? But in the initial stages, you don't because they get that email, uh, they get that message, that LinkedIn message in two places. They get it in their LinkedIn inbox and their email inbox. So that's the advantage of sending it via LinkedIn is you have two opportunities for it to be seen. Nice. Okay. Mm. We, we kind of glossed over this at the very beginning, but I want to go back to it. And this is the prospecting angle. Do salespeople need to have Sales Navigator to, to be reaching you know, the, the quantity of prospects and the quantity of profiles that the average B2B salesperson will be seeing each day? My answer to that question is it depends. There, <laughs> there is no right answer to that question because it really depends on the company size, uh, you know, how many, how many salespeople that they have. There is some advantages to having Sales Navigator if you've got a large sales team because there's, you know, they're being connected through it. Um, most salespeople are going to need a version of a, a premium account at the very least. And the reason for that is because LinkedIn has set something uh, called the LinkedIn uh, commercial uh, search limit. So if you're using this tool as a prospecting tool on a daily basis, you're going to very quickly reach that commercial search limit that is going to require you to upgrade. A couple of other advantages to upgrading. One, you can see everybody who's viewed your profile. A lot of times prospects will view your profile and not connect with you. So now you can you have you know uh, an opportunity to see them viewing your profile and actually reach out to them and connect with them. Uh, the commercial search limits another one. Um, you know in mails. I'm, I'm you know I don't use a lot of in mails. I have a premium account and I rarely use in mails because if I'm sending a connection request and they're accepting it, I can just go to regular messaging. So what's the difference between those two? Because I don't really get that. Is it is an in mail? Just a message to someone you're not connected with. That is correct. That's exactly what it is. An in-mail is only something that you're sending if you're not connected to them. And if you're connected to them, then you just send them a regular LinkedIn message. But surely if you're sending a in-mail, you've probably done something wrong 
or you've, you've not played the game well enough uh, to get that connection in the first place, perhaps? Yeah, you know, I mean, that could be the situation. The situation could be also that the the specific decision maker that you're dealing with is inundated with, with requests on LinkedIn. And, you know, if uh, this is a client that you're really interested in, they haven't responded to your, your connection request, this might be an opportunity for you to send them a really nice email and say, hey, you know, it, it, with more than you know the 300 characters you can send in a in a LinkedIn connection request, a little bit more details about why you want to connect with them and you know uh, and, and so forth. Really, maybe even adding some value there, right there. And with the search limit, uh, so I've got my own little hack around this, but there's probably way simpler ways of doing it. And all I do is search for the person's name in um, in speech marks in Google with the uh, I don't know what you call it, a boolean add on or something to the end of it with LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just do that. And then that, that just seems to circumnavigate it. Absolutely. You can do that. Yep. Cool. Well, that probably made no sense to anyone listening. So I'll, I'll put some pictures or screenshots of that in the show notes over at salesman.red uh, to, 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 to make that more, slightly more understandable. And with that, Melanie, I've got a couple of questions. I ask everyone that comes on the show. First one is, and this is going to be a difficult one to throw at you. Who is the world's greatest salesperson? Oh, my goodness. Oh, you know what? I think that I had uh, one of the world's greatest salespersons, people, female version, uh, working for me years ago. About 15 years ago, I owned a business on the other side of the country in Toronto. And I had this girl working for me, this woman working for me, who was just a phenomenal salesperson, but just an absolutely genuine, nice person. This girl had a photographic memory. She remembered everything about our customers. Even if we hadn't seen them in six months and they would come into our business, she'd be like, oh, how was your daughter's wedding that you went to in Phoenix (laughs) six months ago? And I would just be there and I'd be like, what? Like, how does she remember this stuff? Um, She was phenomenal. Uh, you know, there's uh, there's so many great you know there's so many great salespeople out there. I mean, Jeffrey Gittimer is, is one of the people that I've always kind of uh, you know looked up up to as a sales professional. He actually endorsed my book, The LinkedIn Code. Um, is you know a phenomenal person, and I find I, I, what I love about him is that he's just so friggin' funny. <laughs> yeah. You know, he makes the whole topic of sales so much more interesting. But I think at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the best salesperson is the person that can make people feel important. Nice. Okay, next one. And go deeper on this than I like making my clients, customers happy, or I like seeing progress in their business or whatever it is. But what motivates you personally to close more deals? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, that I know that everything that I'm offering, first of all, I don't ever offer a service unless I, I'm 100% convinced that it's, it's a benefit to people. I turn away more business than I accept. Probably close to 95% of the leads that come to me. I've gotten really good at inbound marketing, so I actually don't go out looking for business. Business comes to me through my inbound marketing efforts. Uh, much of it, though, is not uh, the right business for me. You know, for example, somebody might come to me and say, Melanie, you know, I'd really like your help setting up a Facebook page and I want 10,000 fans. And my, my answer to that is, how is that going to help you? Mm-hmm. How is that going to help you? If it's not going to help you, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm not going to take somebody's money if it's not going to help them. So for me, it's, can I provide a tangible ROI on this investment and if i can then i'm absolutely happy to close that deal and so and, uh, melanie let me just interrupt you there like go go a step deeper into this so we talked about your you, you're moving and you you're joining us in the uk I, I, what one out of you is like is closing more deals which enables something like that to happen is that what motivates you on, on, a, on a deeper level and you know if perhaps if you want to see family over here and that kind of thing is that the underlying motivation of it all, perhaps? I mean, at the end of the day, what motivates anybody is is usually their personal uh, goals and objectives, right? So if you're talking to somebody about what motivates them for business or, or to make money or to close deals or whatever, it's really about what those deals do for them. It's about what that business does for them. It's what that business does for their family. It's what that business does for their lifestyle. Um, at the end of the day, you know, I've made a lot of money in my life, uh, you know, running different businesses that I've had in the past. I used to own a number of different franchises. 
in an industry that didn't really, initially it appealed to me and over time I didn't like it anymore and I didn't feel good about it. And no matter how much money I made, I couldn't feel good about it. I had to get out of that industry. Uh, and it was actually in the weight loss industry, which is a very sales oriented industry. Mm. It's all about sales. Uh, and marketing. And, um, you know, I just started to get really uncomfortable with it and uh, needed to get out and, and basically sold my businesses almost for free just to get out. So I think we're all motivated by money uh, to one degree or another, some much more so than others. At the end of the day, uh, you know, I can only feel good about something if I know that it's truly making a difference in somebody's world or somebody's life or somebody's business. And if it is, then I never feel feel guilty and I don't discount my prices. If people ask for a discount, I'm like, no, I don't discount because why would I? I know I'm providing value and I'm not going to sell, sell something that isn't providing value. So, um, you know, I, I guess at the end of the day, you know, we all are looking for freedom, you know, whether that's, you know, freedom when we retire or freedom while we're still working. Being able to take, you know, I, I know a lot of speakers that say, hey, you know, my, I don't mind traveling, you know, for the bulk of the year, but I take all of July, all of August, and all of December off. This is not me, but many, some of the speakers that I know. <laughs> Sounds nice, though. <laughs> yeah, I don't, have, I don't have that ability because there's too many moving parts in my business to be able to do that. I don't just speak. Speaking is a big aspect of my business, but there's a lot more to it. So, uh, you know, to be able to have that freedom. And, and freedom is, you know, money at the end of the day does create a level of freedom if you manage it properly. It also can really keep you tied down, right? You know, you buy too big of a house, too fancy of a car, and then you just have to keep driving it and driving it and driving it. And, you know, so it's really about finding that balance for you. And, you know, one of my, I have a grown son and um, one of his friends looks up to, uh, to me as a mentor and he's a sales professional. And so I, he wanted to get together with me and, and chat with me and kind of just get some business advice. And, uh, you know, one of the things I told him, and it, he was really surprised by this uh, advice that I shared with him. He's a, he's a young married man, uh, no kids yet. He's working like from 6 a.m. till 2 a.m. He's getting like three, four hours sleep. He's just grinding it really hard. He's got some big goals. Mm -hmm. And he was so shocked at the advice I gave him because the advice that anybody gives at any period of time in their life is coming from the perspective that they're at. So my advice to him was, Jeff, it doesn't matter whether you make $250,000 a year or $2 million a year, your life won't be that different. Because at $250,000 a year, you're going to be very comfortable. You're going to be able to, you know, you're not going to be stressed out about money. And at $2 million a year, your life actually might be more difficult because now you're always having to worry about, hey, does somebody want to be my friend or does somebody want to date me or does somebody want to marry me because of my money? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so there is some problems that come with too much money. Um, at the end of the day, it's, you know, what makes you happy? What do you need to be happy? And I think, you know, finding that balance of time freedom and money freedom is what's going to really ultimately make people happy. Because, you know, if you are... Uh, neglecting your family, neglecting your friends, neglecting your children, neglecting your health or whatever other aspect of your life, it's not worth it. You know, so you do need to find that balance to make, to make it make sense. So it's freedom while you're in business. It's always freedom. I think it's freedom for everybody. It's one kind of freedom or another. Good. I, I got uh, some advice from Peter Sage who I had on the show when we first got started and he put it everything you just said he, he kind of put it that into a i don't know the way i would describe it whether it's an anecdote or simile or metaphor whatever it is but if it, he says most people spend their lives on a hamster wheel so you constantly go around and around and around so then you have your goal for you know perhaps a lot of people here want to retire early perhaps so they're willing to hustle really hard in sales and, and make that happen or perhaps they want to you know make that first million but then you made the millions and you want to make two million then it goes, and you want the bigger house. Then you start hanging around with perhaps more affluent people who are driving better cars than you, so you want the bigger car. And so it just never ends. So he really instilled in the conversation that I had of him of your priorities. And you kind of alluded to it then of once you've got your security in your house or whatever car you want in your family, it gets to a point where you get minimal returns from it. And that's always stuck in my mind. And I, I then, at that point, start to to look back on things and think, well, 
rather than spending so many hours for X amount more, there's probably a point where I'm happy and I know where that is financially. I know how much I want to, I know how much I need to have in the bank and in investments and in property to be able to retire from that. And uh, and so that's all I'm aiming for, for well, the next four years is just a hustle to get to that as quick as possible so that I can semi-retire. And then I'll probably still put in the hours. I'll probably still do the show, but there's no, I don't have to do it. There's no and pressure. There's no pressure. That choice, yeah. that choice is uh, really enticing and a real motivator for me. And Melanie, I've got one final question for you to wrap up the show. This is something I ask everyone that comes on, and this might come back to some of the stuff you've just been talking about. But if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give her to help her become better at sales? Well, that's a tough one for me to answer because the answer that comes to top, comes top of mind right away as soon as you ask that is education, like continuously educating yourself, filling yourself with you know good information, education, positive, uh, you know, positive um, content, um, you know, understanding mindset. You know, that would probably be it. Uh, there's a book that I would recommend everybody read, and it's called Mindset. Well, of course, I'd recommend everybody read my book, The LinkedIn <laughs> Code. <laughs> but the second book I would recommend is Mindset by Carol D- Dweck. I uh, interviewed Carol yesterday. Oh, my goodness. Her show will be on next week, just after this one. Okay, I love that book. It's, it's probably my favorite book. And, you know, we have been conditioned so much throughout our lives by our parents, our education system, you know, role models, whoever – and a lot of times in not very good ways, right? We've, we've developed a fixed mindset and we get stuck in things. Or, and, and you know what? I saw that in myself. So I'll give you an example of that because this book covers everything. It covers parenting, business, um, relationships, uh, finances, everything. Edu- and so for education, I remember when I was a teenager, I am a perfectionist. I've always been a perfectionist. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to cure that a little bit now. <laughs> but I remember sitting down in, my, in the, the classroom uh, writing the final exams for the year. And there was one question that I didn't know the answer to. And I put my head down on the desk and I cried. And I was like 15 years old. I cried because I didn't know the answer to one question. I was a straight A student all through school. And when I was reading that book, I was like, oh my gosh, I have a fixed mindset too. I'm like, I didn't think I did, you know, because like in, a, in many ways I don't. In many ways I have a growth mindset. But there's always certain areas that, mm. you know, we are stuck with because of other people's beliefs that have been instilled upon us. So I would say work on your belief system and any of those limiting beliefs and, you know, continue to grow and educate yourself. It's not enough to have sales skills. Sales skills are phenomenal. They're absolutely needed. No question about it. But, you know, work on some of that personal development stuff too, which is so important in every aspect of your life. Amazing stuff. Well, Melanie, with that, tell us a little bit about the book and tell the audience where they can find out more about you as well. Yeah, absolutely. So my book is The LinkedIn Code. It's available on Amazon. Um, This book was written, basically, I have a service that I offer it. And it's a service where I'll write people's profiles for them and then I'll create their whole lead generation campaign for them and provide a tutorial video as well as a checklist showing them what they should do on a daily and weekly basis. And I saw this service, but many people couldn't afford it. So my plan was to write a book that everybody could afford, teaching them exact same things that I was doing in this service to allow people to have success on LinkedIn, which starts off with creating a killer client-focused LinkedIn profile, understanding LinkedIn etiquette, the do's and the don'ts, the things that you absolutely should avoid doing and the things that you should do. Like, for example, we talked about customizing that, you know, mm-hmm. that connection request. Having those messages sequence written that then you can just customize you know, the first line, make it more personalized, but they can be very much the same if you're going after the same specific target audience. And basically, you know, what you want to be doing on a daily and weekly basis, biggest part of that is prospecting. And maybe staying in touch with, uh, you know, some hot prospects that aren't moving forward. So maybe you create a nurturing campaign where you're just reaching out to them once a, a month or once every three months with, hey, you know, I just came across this and thought that you'd really enjoy it. You know, just kind of maintaining that keep in touch mm-hmm. strategy. So that's what my book is all about. I don't teach you how to do this and this little thing on LinkedIn and this little thing that doesn't actually generate any results. It's all about very specific. And it was written for salespeople because... You know, salespeople don't have a lot of time to sit there and read 
all these little details. It just, it just laser focuses on the things that are going to produce an ROI. Speaking of ROI, I have a, a, a handy uh, little download for um, as a gift for anybody that's listening. You can actually download this at, the, at LinkedInROICalculator.com. LinkedInROICalculator.com. It's a calculator that I created in an Excel spreadsheet that you can go in, you can edit your, and put your own numbers in it. So let's say, for example, you're willing to reach out to six new prospects per day <clears throat> based on the amount of people that will respond, then move forward for, you know, and have a phone call with you and then move forward to the proposal stage and then, you know, ultimately become clients. It'll show you, you know, kind of how that works and what kind of numbers you can, you can expect for your LinkedIn efforts. You know, what is the ROI on your LinkedIn efforts? Because unless you can visually see that, and really understand it, mm. it's kind of hard to really get into it. But when you can visualize that and see, oh my gosh, if I reach out to 10 people per day on LinkedIn, 10 new prospects per day, at the end of each month, I will have, you know, let's say, for example, you know, four new clients that and my average sale of a client is $12,000, for example. So that's now $48,000. And they repeat purchases, you know, typically about five times. So now my ROI on that is, you know, that $48,000 times five. And I'm going to do that month after month after month after month after month. And share your website URL as well. Yeah, okay, so uh, I have two websites. I have topdogsocialmedia.com, which is where I blog. I post lots of really great content on social selling, LinkedIn, and other social networks. And then I have a website that talks about uh, my book and some of the LinkedIn-related services that I offer, and that's the linkedincode.com. And there's a direct link to Amazon, depending on what country you're in, whether you want Kindle version or paperback, to, uh, to take a look at the book further on Amazon. Amazing stuff. Well, Melanie, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. And there's some we we we've gone down some rabbit holes there, which I wasn't expecting to, which is good. And with that, I want to thank you for joining us today on the Salesman Podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And there we have it, Melanie. Thank you for coming on the show. Massively appreciate it. Thank you for opening up, I guess, a little bit at the end of the show and getting more candid with the answers. I really appreciate that and I know the audience do as well. I want to thank you, Sales Nation, as always, for tuning in. Massively appreciate it. Of course, I say every episode, without you guys, there would be no show. I would not be sitting here putting this content together for you and so I'm grateful for that. And with all that said, I'll speak with you all again tomorrow. <laughs>